before too, and I don't think he usually. You know I know him too well. He and I permanent related in a number of ways. Uh, welcome to the Bethel Historical Society and to the fifth annual Stanley Russell Howe lecture. Uh, Stan is our past uh, curator and executive director and is with us today trying to hide out at the back of the corner. <laughs> and let's all give Stan a round of applause. This, this is not the Stanley Russell Howe Memorial lecture. Uh, so uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, I also want to uh, thank all of the donors uh, that have helped us over the years to uh, support the Howe Lecture Fund. If any of you are interested in donating to the fund, please please let us know. We're always accepting uh, donations. Uh, each year we bring in a scholar uh, and uh, someone who is well well uh, well versed in a particular subject, and and we hope to to delve rather deeply into that subject. Uh, today's uh, program is entitled The Storm of Witchcraft, The Salem Trials, and the American Experience. Our speaker is with us today, Emerson uh, Tad Baker, as we know him, Professor of History at Salem State University. Uh, Tad will discuss his research into the witchcraft hysteria of 1692 in Salem, Massachusetts, and his recent book, uh, which will be on sale after the uh, program special price, one day price only, my market, uh, which sets the Salem witch trials in the broader context of American history from the 17th century to the present and examines their enduring legacy. Uh, Emerson Baker is a professor of history, as I said, at Salem State University. He's the award-winning author of many works on the history and archaeology of early Maine and New England, including The Devil of Great Island, Witchcraft, and Conflict in Early New England. Uh, Baker received his B.A. from Bates College, his M.A. from the University of Maine, and his Ph.D. in history from William & Mary. He served as an advisor and on-camera expert for the PBS series Colonial House. And so without any further ado, would you please give us, give a warm Bethel welcome to Emerson Tad Baker. Thank you so much, Randy. It's uh, always good to be back in Bethel. I don't, I, I don't know, I've probably talked here for maybe four or five years, maybe since the last book came out. I'm not sure. Uh, it's, it's, always, it's always fun to be here, and uh, uh, my wife and I drove up. Uh, we live in York, so it's, uh, it's a nice country drive, drive for us, and uh, her family's over around Turner, so we head back over that way to the family, and it's just perfect for me. Um, my, my, my wife, is, we have a, a rather a, a basset hound that loves people so much that she's a pain in the neck, so they're out walking. <laughs> my wife sure just talked so many times I gave her a good excuse to she's here to talk about the book now for many, many years. Um, and it is it is a real honor to be giving this lecture, like because I've, I've I've known and worked with Stan for, for many years. And uh, when I was in, in grad school at the University of Maine, he was uh, he 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 did, graduated a few years ahead of me, and he was one of the ones that sort of the successful example of yes. You, you can get your PhD in history and, and get a job. <laughs> so, um, and, and up at the University of Maine, I, um, uh, ever since I really have studied Maine history, so for me to some degrees, this is kind of a bit of a, a departure uh, because it, uh, it, it, having taught in Salem State for over 20 years, I, I'm, I've gone into you know, Massachusetts history. Um, but actually, of course, in the time period I'm studying, we're all just, it's all the same. Um, but in some things, too, in, the, in this book, and you'll hear a little bit about it here today, uh, I, I really sort of point out that the Salem Witch Trials are a New England-wide experience, and that, in fact, as we'll see, if it weren't for events in Maine, I think the Salem Witch Trials wouldn't have, have happened. And uh, as we'll see, we'll get to the end, there's actually, uh, well, actually a, direct, a direct tie into to Bethel and to, and to Sunday River uh, in the book. So um, I'd like to start by, by reading the, uh, the first page or so, and I'll end by reading like the last page. And then we'll try to fill in some of the blanks in between. But not too many, because that is a really good sale point, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have to buy some more myself. Introduction, an old valuables cabinet. Tucked away in a corner of the Peabody Essex Museum in the city of Salem, sits one of the great artifacts of early American history, a small oak valuables cabinet. Its elaborate carvings, turnings, and geometric shapes speak to its beauty and craftsmanship. The center panel features a sunburst that surrounds the inscription I and VP 79. 
The initials refer to its owners, Joseph and Bathsheba Pope. Now, the letter J was not yet utilized in the 17th century, so the I had double duty for it. Mm -hmm. Interesting, huh? The Popes were married in 1679, and the cabinet, presumably a wedding gift, was likely made by James Simons, a master Salem furniture maker. It was passed down in the family until it was acquired by the museum in 2000. The Popes were Quakers who lived in Salem Village, members of a small but significant minority of religious dissenters who had been persecuted by the Bay Colony. In 1692, the Popes turned the tables. Like some of her neighbors, Bathsheba said she was afflicted by witches, specifically claiming that the specters of John Proctor, Martha Corey, and Rebecca Nurse tormented her. Joseph Pope added his testimony against Proctor. The court convicted and executed all three of the accused. A rare piece of locally made 17th century furniture with an impeccable history of ownership and a strong tie to the Salem witch trials, the cabinet is a remarkable relic. A status reflected in the formidable $2.4 million that the museum had to pay to win it at auction in 2000. I should explain, this is not like a blanket chest, folks. This thing is about the size of a bread box. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yet, what makes the cabinet truly a treasure, at least to me, is rarely noted. The Pope's nephew was Benjamin Franklin. Wow. <laughs> Specifically, Bathsheba's younger sister, Abiah, was Franklin's mother. So in one generation, one Massachusetts family would go from victims of witchcraft to producing one of the leaders of the American Enlightenment. While his aunt and uncle would join the frenzied call for witch executions, Ben Franklin would make the reasoned case for a new nation dedicated to liberty and freedom. The Pope cabinet shows just how soon after Salem that the American colonies would turn their back on the age of witch hunts and embrace the age of reason. It is really like a light switch going on. And in fact, that is to uh, uh, foreshadow a dramatic twist of plot towards the end of my, my, uh, my talk that you will be completely surprised by, but it will make perfect sense based on what I just said. The story of the popes and their cabinet also reveals the complexities behind the Salem witch trials and trials elsewhere in New England, as well as some of the inaccuracies in how these events are often portrayed. Traditional textbooks and popular tales make the trial sound like a Puritan affair. Yet I said the popes were Quakers. The afflicted in Salem were almost all female and are usually referred to as girls. Yet Bathsheba was 40 when she made her accusations. Furthermore, men had made up the majority of accusers in New England before 1692. Bathsheba and her cohorts suffered spectral attack. That is, they were assaulted by a spirit or a ghost that was invisible to everyone except the afflicted. This too was rare before Salem. Typically, a witch was accused of maleficium or harmful witchcraft, which could cause injury to livestock and crops, destruction of property, or even illness or death but a witch need not employ such a specter to cause such evil. Though what happened in 1692 was often portrayed as a local affair, Bathsheba Pope was born and raised on distant Nantucket Island. These are but a few of the contradictions behind what happened in 1692, during a witch hunt that was in many ways an aberration from earlier proceedings. And therein, to some degrees, is where I got really interested in this, because having taught in Salem State now for 22 years, the more you study this, the more things didn't seem to fit. So, after having written another book on witchcraft 10 years earlier in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and in Maine, I said it was time to tackle Salem. At which point my friend said, gee, Ted, that's nice, but do we really need another book on the Salem witch trials? Because there's literally one published every year. This year, there will be two. Uh, there's one already out by Ben Ray called Satan in Salem, and Stacy Schiff, the, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner, who actually was just a couple years behind me in, in prep school, but has managed to snag the Pulitzer and won something else. Not a bad accomplishment. Uh, she, her, her, her last book was on Cleopatra, and now her new one is uh, on Salem Witch Trials, and it'll be out next week. Mine's a much better book, though. <laughs> Hers cost more. Um, actually, well, I'll be interested to see it, but she says she's, she, no, she's a really good writer, but she's not a historian. So, you know, um, I'd like to try to think I wrote a book that is actually readable and is also written by a historian, which I, I admit this, this is not always the case. But anyhow. Um, my friends have said, do we really need another book on the trials? And it reminds me of this quote from John Demos where he says, It is mainly embarrassing for a historian to summon his colleagues to still another consideration of early New England witchcraft. Surely, here is a topic previous generations of writers have sufficiently worked. That quote was made by John Demos in 1970. <laughs> but it was before he himself published two books on the subject. <laughs> so I figured John could do it, and John knows of this book, he's read it, and you approved the project, so I said I was going to go ahead and do it as well. Um, but 
I had to write it because of these contradictions. And also to find out why Salem was the witch city. You know, uh, I do live in Maine, but uh, working in Salem, I can go anywhere around the world. I've been friends in the Sahara Desert where they told someone that they were from Salem, and it was like, oh, the witch city. <laughs> so to me, it was interesting as to why Salem the witch city, because in fact, there were about 100,000 people who were accused of witchcraft during the great <coughs> age of witch hunts in Europe and her American colonies. Um, about half of them, we believe, died. The numbers are big, round, fuzzy figures, frankly, because some of these outbreaks are so big that we don't even have the names or the exact count. And a matter of fact, the largest outbreak that took place in the mid-1620s to mid-1630s in Cologne, in Germany, where about 2,000 people died. So, that's... Salem's numbers are, are, are horrific, but by comparison, they're nothing. In Salem, 172 people are either formally accused or informally cried out upon. I found about 16 people, uh, particularly high-ranking people like the governor's wife, who had been, someone had said they were a witch, but they never started legal proceedings against. So 172, 19 people executed, one pressed to death, and five died in prison while awaiting trial. I don't mean to minimize those numbers compared to Europe or to say that that tragedy isn't, isn't huge because one of those people who died in prison, Roger Toothpaker, actually was an ancestor of mine. Um, but by European standards, folks, this isn't even a moderately sized witchcraft outbreak, right? This is small potatoes. And so why is it, you know, I've been to Cologne. I don't know if you've ever been to Cologne. It's a beautiful city, wonderful cathedral. They don't, no one, no one mentions witchcraft there. I've never heard anyone say Cologne is a witch city, right? Um, so why, why is it Salem? And again, you know, my friends said, well, you know, come on, Ted. That's because it was the age of reason, right? And, and everyone knew better than to accuse witches. Oh, really? The witch hunts in Europe continued well into the 18th century, with hundreds and hundreds dying. Uh, the last uh, witch was actually in, in, uh, in the United States was actually tried and convicted in 1730. Um, she's a, she is actually the lesser crime of enchantment, and she gets 39 lashes for it. That is what we would call white magic, uh, telling fortunes, using Ouija boards, finding lost objects, he uh, healing people through magic. And you all knew that there was, there were, there was black magic where people if you kill people in white magic, we could help people, because I trust we've all seen The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Linda, the good witch of the North, who tried to help them, right? So it's a, it's a long tradition, this idea of, of, of folk healers and good witches. So still, that gets you 39 lashes in 1730, well after Salem. Um, so clearly that's not it either. So what is it? Well, I think, to me, one of the, one of the things I try to do in this book that, that I think is sort of missing from other books on Salem, and there are a lot of really good books written on this stuff, but, uh, but, but a lot of them are like really narrowly focused, like, let's just look at Salem Village, which, by the way, is present-day Danvers, uh, when the outbreak took place across much of uh, Essex County uh, and extended it re with people being accused from Maine, even. Um, or let's just look as women as witches. And I said, you know, we really need to step back and look at the big picture and look and see how this event fits into Salem's history. And, and by the way, that is still very much a live picture today. Uh, I thought the last third of my book is sort of focused at, on the, from the witch trials onward. And I guess it's because I'm used to, you know, in Salem, we have haunted happenings every October, um, which is uh, kind of a controversial event in his own right, which is maybe you'll see as, as this talk unfolds exactly why. So what I did in this book, though, was to try to look at, at how the witch trials fit in the history of Salem from its <coughs> European founding uh, as the, as the, as the uh, town of, of Namkeed in 1626, uh, when Roger Conant uh, led a group of, of settlers south from Cape Ann. They'd actually tried to, fish, to build a fishing station there. It had burnt down. Back then, when you wanted to make salt, uh, to salt your cod, you would actually boil salt water. And they had a fire that got out of control. They burnt the whole station down and then moved south um, about 15 miles to try their luck again in Salem. I'd like to point out that this is Roger Conant, or statue to him. It's today, unfortunately, it is out in front of an old church that is now the Salem Witch Museum. So <laughs> everyone assumes this must be a witch or a witch judge. <laughs> it's not, it's Roger Conant. And of course, Namke had been settled by Native Americans for about 8,000 years. So this is, this is an old place, uh, with a new life. Namke meaning the fishing place in, uh, in Algonquin. But three years later, uh, the settlement at Namke in all of Massachusetts becomes part of a new colony, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And a new, a new governor, uh, uh, Go governor uh, Indicott will arrive. And, and as a symbol of the Massachusetts Bay Colony arriving and the sort of peaceful transfer of power, from Conan to Endicott, they renamed the community, and they renamed it Salem, right? which is which is, is, is uh, peace. It is short for the for, for Hebrew word Jerusalem, city of peace. 
So Salem is peace. And, and it sort of suggests the religious ideals, the Puritan ideals, that went into this community. Um, in, in fact, uh, many, many people outside of Salem don't realize this, but Salem, not Boston, is the first settlement of Massachusetts Bay, right? The first colony in Massachusetts would be, uh, is, is Plymouth, the Plymouth Colony, um, you know, the, the Pilgrims. Uh, but that's a separate colony from the rest of Massachusetts until the Charter of 1691. Um, and so, you know, no one says, oh, it all started in Boston. No, it didn't. It started a few years before that, and it started in Salem. And so, in 1630, when the, the Great Migration comes with over a thousand settlers led by yet a new governor, John Winthrop, they arrive in Salem. And it is on the trip over in the ship Arbella, or in the harbor, or shortly thereafter, when, when Winthrop gives his very famous sermon, A Model of Christian Charity. And it's something that we read in all of the history textbooks, right? the concept of a city upon a hill, that we shall be as a city upon the hill, and the eyes of all people are upon us. That the Puritans have come to Massachusetts Bay to create a Christian utopian community. It is going to be perfection. It is going to be harmony. We are going to live under God's rule and, and, and live in, 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 in peace with our neighbors and our families. It is going to be so perfect that everyone, the Puritans are not interested in sending out missionaries to convert people to their version of Christianity. It's going to be so perfect, they're going to not going to need to, right? They're going to see how spectacular and how successful this is and how godly this community is. And everyone, Native American, European, you name it, is going to drop what they're doing and run to the city upon the hill, run to Salem to be just like them. Now, it's a beautiful ideal, as, as any kind of utopian community is. But as with all utopian communities, no matter how well they turn out, they're going to fall short of the ideal. It's just, just the nature of life. However, I think it's hard for people to imagine just how far from the mark Salem fell, right? That people who had heard Winter give his sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, were still alive, some of them, in 1692, when husbands were accusing wives, daughters were accusing mothers and grandmothers of witchcraft. Uh, and I think, to some degrees, I think that's part of the answer here as to why Salem's a witch city, is because Salem itself has never forgotten this. And, and has never forgiven itself, and frankly, no one else really has either, for this huge fall from grace, uh, from this idea of a utopian America to, to the reality of the, of the witch hunts. Um, but also, too, um, I think we remember Salem as the witch city because the witch trials were really a critical turning point in American history. And, and I'm not just saying that because this book was written for the Pivotal Moments in American History series from Oxford University Press. I genuinely believe that the, the aftermath of Salem drastically changes the path, not just of Salem history or Massachusetts history, but American history. Um, and, and in fact, actually, about the last, as I say, the last third of the book is kind of set in that time period. So I really kind of want to focus my talk on that today to explain why this is such an important moment, why we remember Salem. And also, too, uh, part of that answer, too, is going to be I think Salem is that first example, that, that, that origins of the American distrust in government, some degree that libertarian streak in American politics that, that we see right now where, you know, we look at the debates and no one wants to elect anybody president who's ever held office at least above dog catcher before, right? <laughs> I mean, there's a reason for that, folks. Uh, so, but having said that, so I really, I, I'm, at the end, I'm more than happy to, to talk to folks and answer any questions about the witch trials. Uh, but my talk today isn't really going to be outlined in the course of the trials as much as to some of the key events as to why they happened, and to some degrees, why the, why the trials took place as, as the way they did. Um, one thing in, in, in this, this series of books is to really to look at the role of the individuals and how individual decisions uh, change the course of history. And I, 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 I thank my, my editor, Tim Bedford, for being interested in this, in this book project because previous books are things like, you know, in this series, uh, or things like uh, books on Antietam, or a David Hackett Fisher's book, Washington Crossing the Delaware. That was the first book in the series and one of the Pulitzer, so it's kind of like, no pressure there to add, you know. Um, so this is maybe a little more subtle, but I do think it's an important change. But having said that, so what happened? Well, to some degrees, uh, that's why I call the title of the book A Storm of Witchcraft. I equate the events of 1692 to that other great Essex County tragedy, the perfect storm that, that wiped out the Essex County fishing fleet, the loss of many lives. Um, you take, it takes a, a huge number of different factors to come together at once, huge bad factors, right, to create what is by far the largest and worst outbreak of witchcraft in American history. Because even if 
Salem is admittedly small by European standards. It, uh, it, it's, it's, it's cast a giant sad shadow over all uh, witchcraft accusations. Um, more than half of the witchcraft accusations in early New England take place in Salem, right? Um, so what, what is at the root of Salem? Um, Long-standing village factionalism in Salem Village, particularly focused around its, its fourth minister, Samuel Paris. Uh, Boyer and Nissenbaum's book, Salem, is asking the classic study on this. Um, Colony-wide political instability. Governor Phipps and his top advisor, Reverend Increase Mather, have spent the past couple of years in England in the colony trying to get a new charter for Massachusetts Bay. Uh, the Dominion of New England has been overthrown. There's an interim government. Only in May 1692, when there's already over 50 people in jail for witchcraft, Will Phipps and Mather return to the colony. And even then, their first job of the government is to reestablish the whole code of laws for the colony. Because under the new charter of 1691, it says, OK, ditch your old legal code and make new ones that are, are agreeable, that are not repugnant, was the legal word, with the laws of England. So there's a lot of uncertainty about this. And even though Phipps is a good Maine boy, uh, born and raised in Woolwich, Maine, uh, so he's a local of sorts, there's a lot of doubt as to what's going on. Um, there's also, too, this ongoing uh, um, sort of storyline in early Massachusetts, early New England history, of the decline of Puritanism, it's referred to as, referred to as Puritan, Puritan declension or decline. And it is the idea that the city, by the 1690s, the city upon the hill is already being lost. Um, and this is an idea that, that is seen by declining church membership, declining church attendance, um, and that because the Puritans have the special covenant with God, God is increasingly upset with his people, his chosen people of Massachusetts, and uh, is showing his anger to them. Uh, and you have the, and, uh, s the signs of this being King Philip's War, where he's unleashed Native Americans on the colony. And you have all the ministers preaching these fire and brimstone sermons known as Jeremiah's, right? God is coming, and he's terribly angry at you. Um, now, having said that, so many people were so worked up about the decline of Puritan faith that it probably is much more of a perceived decline than real. But also, remember, this is the 17th century. It really is uh, before the, the age of reason. Um, everything then that you see is a sign of God's pleasure or displeasure. Right? So when things go wrong, uh, like a declining church membership, uh, and then you see bad crops, bad weather, wars, signs of that God is, is saying, yes, things are going wrong here. So even though it was, it was a perceived decline, it was very real and important to the story. Um, we're also talking about the worst weather of the Little Ice Age. Of course, they didn't know that at the time. But between about 1400 to 1800, we have uh, a time period known as the Little Ice Age when weather was considerably colder than it is now. And what's interesting about this is, uh, I, when I first studied this, I assumed climate history went like, you know, temperatures were really warm here in 1400 and they gradually declined and they reached their bottom about 1600. And then they got warmer, so by 1800 they were back to normal. Uh, 1800 and freeze, 1815 being the last of those really bad years, a very famous year in New England, where there literally was a frost, at least one frost every month, right? Um, turns out, though, it's not like that. And you'll appreciate this, folks. Rapid climate change uh, goes like this. So in like the 1680s and 1690s, see if this doesn't sound vaguely familiar, horrible, horrible winters, those the worst on record. Frosts, killer frosts, really late into the spring. But the summers were excruciatingly hot and dry. <laughs> Sounds a bit like this year, except in, in these years that also have really early frosts as well. In this case, I was in my swimming pool on September 21st. But again, really strange weather, real extremes. But what happens? Crop failure, uh, uh, bad harvest, inflation, famine. And to make matters worse, we'll talk about there's a, another, a whole war going on which makes this worse. All these factors going on, but by the way, ergot poisoning has really absolutely nothing to do with this. I'll, I'll rule that one out right now because that question always gets asked. But again, if you want, feel free to ask me and I'll explain. <laughs> so, all of these conditions um, are really fueling the fire throughout the summer of 1692. Um, and one thing I looked at in the, in, the, in, the, in the book that other scholars really hadn't done was to particularly to look at the role of the judges. Um, it seemed to me you can have as many juries as you want. Uh, find people guilty, but it takes judges to accept that verdict and it accepts ju uh, judges to sign the death warrants. So I wondered why you have a, nine, a panel of nine judges who would do this. Um, so I kind of really tried to focus in on the judges and, and clearly uh, they, like other people in New England in 1692, see so many things going on that they are seeing Satan in their midst. Um, 
And that makes them, I think, behave in, in ways that were against the English justice system. This is not kangaroo justice. We have learned justices. It was illegal to be a lawyer in Massachusetts in 1692. But these were, these were, these were uh, well-educated men. Um, there were, there were our grand juries. There's evidence. There's trial by jury. All those things, you know, assume, assume innocence until guilt is proven. Um, yet, look, look at what's going on in the first hearings in 1692, that, that a pattern that persists throughout the trials. The very first day, Judge Haythorne, of course, the ancestor of Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, asked Sarah Good, one of the first three people accused of witchcraft, what evil spirit have you familiarity with? Have you made no contract with the devil? Why do you hurt these children? And by the way, when did you stop beating your husband? Right? <laughs> I mean, completely leading questions that assume guilt. And the only answer is this, tell us how you did it. Right? Um, to some degrees, it reminds me, you know, on... Uh, on, on um, on Channel 6 and Channel 2 on, on Sunday mornings, my wife and I like to watch the reruns of The Closer. Uh, and it's the same thing, right? Let's get them into the room, and even if we're kind of, we're going to use some tricky means here, but it's okay because we know that they did it. And all we're trying to do is get them to confess that they did it, and, uh, or maybe we'll get them to turn state's evidence and then get Mr. Big, right? Um, this is kind of what's going on here to some degrees, right? Um, so why? Why are they behaving this way? Why are they hanging judges? And even more to the point is, it's one thing to go in with a presumption of guilt, but they're turning legal precedent on its head. So let me explain exactly what's going on here. Before 1692, if you pled guilty, that is, if you confessed to being a witch, usually, by the way, after judicial torture, so why would someone confess to being a witch? Because as soon as you confess, you're almost immediately taken, tried, convicted, and executed. So why would you confess? Well. Uh, we know that you're allowed back to use judicial torture. That is where things did differ a little bit in English legal practice between then and now. Um, we know, for example, in 1692, that uh, John Proctor, before he was executed for witchcraft, wrote a letter to the judges complaining about the treatment of his son and another young boy who had been, uh, put, out, who had been put in prison under suspicion of witchcraft. He says the boys were tied neck and heels, which is you literally take a rope and you tie someone's neck to their heels, and then you hang them upside down until blood gushes out of their nose. Now, you're probably not going to die from this, but you think you're going to, right? At which point, you're sort of, I'm loosening you up here. Now maybe, now maybe you're ready to tell the truth, of course, which is that you're a witch. Um, I think maybe it's kind of the 17th century for the water boarding in some ways, right? won't kill you, but it, you think it will. Um, interestingly enough, there had only been one confession for witchcraft in the way, but only one execution in about the 40 years before the Salem Witch Trials. There had been earlier person, uh, executions, but they seemed on their way out until 1688, when an, an Irish washerwoman, uh, we don't even know her first name, so we used to refer to her as Goody, short for good wife. Back then, all, every, men and women would not be known as Mr. and Mrs., they'd be known as good man and good wife. And it was only like, you know, the, the upper classes that would be known as Mr. and Mistress. Uh, so a uh, Goody Glover uh, was actually uh, a Pride for witchcraft, uh, for <laughs> afflicting uh, 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 some young children uh, who were neighbors. And uh, she confessed to witchcraft. But even in 1688, they said, wait a second, you didn't torture you, why did you confess to being a witch? So before they pass sentence and have her executed, what do they do? They bring in a panel of doctors, physicians, to interview her and make sure that she's sane. Because clearly, if she's <laughs> lost her mind and is saying she's a witch, She's not a witch, and we can't execute her. You know, she's, she's a poor woman. We just need to look after her. Um, unfortunately for her, they, the judges, uh, the doctors, the judges find her competent, and she is subsequently executed. Um, I think in this case, what happened is, uh, honestly, is that the real problem, um, and I, I don't make any offense, but it's the real problem is that she was Irish. Um, <laughs> which, well, here's the problem: we don't think she spoke English. She probably was speaking Gaelic. Um, and also, too, as being raised Irish, she would have actually been raised a Catholic. And so, if you sort of understood the question and someone asked you about, you know, do you worship spirits and deities, she might say, well, you know, oh, yeah, of course, I have my saints. Right? Veneration of saints. So, anyhow, unfortunately, um, she dies. Four years later, some of the same judges that used such caution to make sure that she was sane before they executed her, are sitting on the panel of judges at the Salem Witch Trials. And in this case, they, they stand legal precedent on its head. Because in 1692, 
only those who refused to confess, only those people who pleaded not guilty, died. Yeah, um, as opposed to, look at this, All there are 55 people who confess. Over a third of the people who are formally charged confess to being a witch. Physical impossibility. They're lying, but they do it, and no one questions this entity because, isn't it interesting? There have been 28 trials where, in every case, the person pled not guilty every time they were convicted and sentenced to death. And the real miracle is, frankly, is that sentence was delayed in some cases on some of these folks because they, were, they, would plead, they say plead their belly because women were pregnant, or were given a month or so to prepare their souls for death. Uh, we're lucky in that sense that only 19 died. Um, but because every one of them... So if you looked around and you saw the people who had been charged with witchcraft, those who said not guilty were all dead. Those who said, yeah, I'm a witch, they were still alive. And again, uh, you know, um, like we, we see today on the, on the crime dramas, on the closer, they're kept alive, if you will, because, okay, you were at the satanic mass last week, and really, um, witchcraft is seen as an inversion of Christianity, right? So, okay, when you went to the black mass and the devil was leading the congregation, who was sitting next to you? Who's in your congregation? You know, so basically, who, can you turn state's evidence and give us some more names? Um, so, to me, this is really the, 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 the ultimate tragedy in Salem, and I guess to some degrees why I really find offense with the fact that uh, you know, haunted happenings in Salem consist of a lot of uh, uh, fried dough and vampire fangs and stuff like this, because we're really talking about celebrating the deaths of 19 Christian martyrs, right? Those people who could have saved their souls, all they had to do was say, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, I said not guilty, but I, yeah, I'm really a witch, okay. I mean, it really sounds crazy, but this is what, this is what all they would have needed to do. Um, so I started looking at the judges as to why they're accepting this, this behavior, why they flipped legal precedent on its head. And I found, you know, and again, it's an amazing, amazing group of people, uh, and some of you maybe some echoes uh, today with American politics. Um, the nine judges, they are all wealthy merchants. They are the wealthiest men of the colony for the most part. They are also the leading politicians. They are all members of the governor's council. Today, that would, we would call that the state senate. And they actually, these guys had all been handpicked by Increase Mather and the, and the king and queen in England to serve on that initial council of the charter. Um, so they're also, as, as, as politicians, they're supporters of this campaign for moral reformation. Um, this effort to stop this Puritan decline that is perceived. So imagine our legislature doing this today. In 1690, the general court, led by <coughs> these judges and others, passed an order calling for moral reformation. And it says, we're going to make sure that everyone's back in church like they're supposed to be. We're, we're going to encourage people to, to become church members. Um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to make sure that all the children are in school reading their Bible as they should. Uh, we're going to make sure that the taverns close promptly and that no one drinks to excess. That it, Yes, you know, Puritans are not horrible people. They enjoy humor and color and an occasional pint of beer. But it's going to be one and done, boys, and then home to the family and be up early to go to church on Sunday and spend all day there, right? Trying to legislate morality and religion in the colony. Uh, because be, why? Because things are so bad, we know Satan is loose. And the judges realize this. Um, interestingly enough, a majority of these judges had attended Harvard. <laughs> Only a handful of them graduated. But here's the thing. <laughs> well, but still, that was better than everyone else. Because they, look, Harvard is created as a place like, like actually, like most colleges were up, up through the 19th century, as, as institutions to train ministers. Mm -hmm. And in particular, this is the place where the next generation of Puritan ministers is going to come from. And that in its own self is really telling, because none of these fellows, except for one, uh, Judge Stoughton had ever served as a minister, and he'd only served briefly in England for a few years. So in 1692, none of these guys are ministers. Um, instead, uh, rather than, if you will, not taking vows of poverty, these ministers were reasonably compensated, but in, instead, you know, it's, well, frankly, frankly, it's kind of like college professors. You know, they give you enough money to survive, but you're supposed to, it's like, considered to be a high status position. Um, uh, in, you know, sort of like a respected member of the community. That's what ministers were. These guys said, no, nah, I don't think so. I'm going to become the wealthiest merchant in town instead, right? I, mean, I think of Samuel Sewell, who, um, who had the choice of, uh, of becoming a minister, he graduated from Harvard, or, you know, would you like to marry Hannah, uh, Hannah Hull, who's the only child of the wealthiest merchant in Boston, who's looking for a 
uh, and, and her, her dad is looking for a son-in-law to run the family business because he's getting old. And so it's kind of a burden, but we really need someone to become the wealthiest merchant in Boston when he dies. Do you want to do that or do you want to become a minister? Now, now I think, I'm honestly being a little, maybe a little unfair here because I really think Sewell was one of these guys who genuinely, genuinely, uh, like, like actually all the judges, some priests, believe that he wasn't worthy. Um, he's riddled with doubt. And, and he, he's a God-fearing Puritan. And he's even afraid, he isn't sure whether he's worthy to become a member of his church. That's how riddled with doubt he is. Which some degrees tells you how, how devout he was, right? And he certainly was a good candidate. Um, but I, and I think to some degrees this is part of the answer to what went wrong. Because Puritans are, have their path chosen by God. And they know what it is from a young age, right? Uh, you know, they're calling. And uh, to think that when these boys were, you know, 8, 10, 12 years old, the calling was for them to become ministers, to become leaders of the flock, leaders of the faith. Yet somehow, for some reason, they turned away from that. And, and I think probably they were sort of troubled by this the rest of their lives, um, in many ways. And, 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 I, and, I, and finally, in 1692, I think the light bulb goes on. And now they understand. Because in 1692, the city upon the hill, the great Puritan experiment, will face its biggest challenge, the one that may destroy it. Satan has been set loose in the colony, and this time, the ministers cannot save it. It is up to the judges to save it. So this, all of a sudden, it's like this, they finally understand why God had chosen the different path for them. They needed that education, they needed that background, but, they, but God would need them as the judges to rid Massachusetts of the witches and Satan. And the sad part is that they were far too good at that job. Um, now, interesting too is that these folks are, as most merchants at the time would have been, these, these family groups were closely related. Six of the nine judges are actually related by marriage. They're essentially brother-in-laws, uh, part of a merchant network. And yes, he, that means, and actually their nephew is the sheriff of Essex County. So let's see, uh, rich, all related, politicians, businessmen, um, Frankly, things in Massachusetts politics, maybe national politics, haven't changed all that much. It's usually, they usually say, like, you know, what kind of job can the legislators get for their nephews? Well, that's old traditions, unfortunately. Um, and to me, the, and I, so I studied a lot of the genealogy on this. I'm not a genealogist, but it seems to me you need to know these connections. And a lot of historians are like, hey, we don't study genealogy. You know, that's, that's, that's for genealogists. Like, but you need to know people's relationships. And these patterns are really important. And to me, there's an even more important one than that. And that is, I uh, found out uh, a little known fact, and that is Judge Sewell, uh, again, who's I think one of the smartest members of, of the trials, the guys who, who later on will, will, will uh, be terribly upset is what he did, and actually we'll talk about apologize for his behavior. How was Sewell taken in? How was he willing to convict witnesses that he, if he really knew, if he was smart enough to know what was going on? And then I found out the problem. The problem was, he's actually related to Samuel Paris, Reverend Paris of Salem Village, who's at the center of the witchcraft outbreak. Paris's daughter and his niece who lives with him are the first two girls to be afflicted in Salem Village. And so Paris's first cousin is Hannah Hull, uh, Hannah Hull Sewell, Samuel's wife. Uh, before the Parises were in Salem Village, they lived in Boston, where the Hulls and the Sewells would have been their only family. So these families would have been really close. And so you can imagine when Samuel Sewell shows up in Salem Village and sees his, what they would call each other, cousin. cousin, cousin the, uh, now, Samuel Perry says, Cousin Samuel, thank God you're here. Look what's happened to our family. Look at your nieces. Help. Please help. And so, you know, if any of your family member tells you to help with something like that, you help. And it's only later on that Sewell realizes what a tragic mistake it was. Um, the other problem that's going on, and this gets back to me, and, oh, by the way, so you folks are getting like the hour-long version today of the 15-week graduate seminar. <laughs> so we can go on and on. And in the graduate class, we spend a solid week talking about the connections between Maine and the Salem Witch Trials because it is this horrible, on, a never-ending war on the Maine frontier uh, that in many ways is, creates a war scare which leads to the Salem Witch Trials. By the way, it's hard to believe that in 1692, Salem Village, Danvers, now we're on like the North Shore Mall, the Liberty Tree Mall. That was the edge of the frontier. Beyond that, you had like Handover and Haverhill, and that was about it. And these towns were actually uh, vulnerable to Indian attack, in large part because by 1692, pretty much all the settlements of Maine, actually north of where I live in York, had been destroyed in Indian raids. Um, and what's even worse is, it's, there's a symbolism of this war. Who are the English fighting against? Who, 
Who are the, the defenders, the current defenders of the city of Ponte Hill fighting against? They're fighting against, pardon me, the, the papist Catholic French, which is where the Puritans would have perceived them. There was a, almost an irrational hatred of, uh, of the Catholics in the 17th century England. Um, they viewed them really as bomb throwing terrorists. Uh, and in fact, in 1605, the gunpowder plot that had been a Catholic who tried to blow up Parliament. So, as with most cases, you know, uh, it, only take, it only takes one, one, one Muslim to, to completely uh, say that all of them are terrorists. Well, it only took one Catholic or two to make sure that all the English thought they all were. Um, and who could be worse to be in league with for the Catholics? Pardon me, heathen Native Americans, like the Wabnaki of Maine. Uh, people who are not Christian, or if they have become Christian and converted to Catholicism, which is probably might be the only thing worse than being a French Catholic, would be a Native American who converted to Catholicism, right? Because they chose the wrong Christianity by the Puritan standard. So there's a huge symbolism where it looks like Satan's allies, his minions, in the forms of the, of the, of the Pope and his troops, the Catholics, and the Native Americans, are going to destroy the Puritan experiment. So this is just a uh, rock with symbolism. Um, and here's the problem. Guess what, folks? Once again, the judges happen to be the leaders of this military effort. Because back then, your politicians and your merchants were also your militia officers. They were elected as your militia officers, you know? Uh, and so, uh, in fact, one of the witchcraft judges, Colonel Wade Winthrop, who is the grandson of John Winthrop, who gave the city of Palm Hill sermon, um, is made the commander in chief of the Massachusetts militia that is fighting this war and losing. Frankly, he had no military credentials. His military credentials really was that his, his father was John Winthrop Jr. and his grandfather was John Winthrop, which meant that he should be able to lead an army. He couldn't. Uh, most of the other witchcraft judges are colonels, majors, or captains in that, in that war. They're also, by the way, huge speculators in frontier lands in Maine. Uh, lands that before that King William's War had been worth a lot of money. Four of the witchcraft judges, Sewell, Haythorne, Corwin, and Gedney, all own not only large tracts of land in Maine, but also sawmills. These merchants are cutting down wood, sawing it up, and, and selling it in the triangular trade, of the Atlantic trade, right? Um, when, they, when you lose a sawmill when it burns down, uh, Samuel Sewell, he, he estimated his losses at 1,200 pounds, which today would be over a million dollars. So these guys were upset and angry, they would lost a lot of money, and they're looking for someone to blame. And frankly, it's human nature not to look within, but to look outside. So, you know, and, and you're looking outside, okay, let's blame the government of Massachusetts. Wait a second, that's us. Okay, <laughs> how about the military? Wait a second, that's us too. As Dana Carvey used to say on Saturday Night Live, could it be Satan? <laughs> Satan responsible for this? Let, it's so easy to, to you know, say, we, it's not our fault, right, when it really was. Um, so anyhow, um, the other thing too is that we could talk all day on here. And actually, if you're really interested in, Port in Portland, I'm actually giving a talk about ties between witchcraft and the frontier in Maine um, as a part of the uh, big lecture series, um, uh, Spirits Alive, that will be in the spring. But um, in, in that talk, I would talk about all these connections where not just the judges, but huge percentage, at least probably about a third of the people involved in the war trials, had connections to Maine. Um, family members who fought up here. A lot of the, re a lot of the girls who are the afflicted are refugees uh, from Maine who moved back down to Massachusetts. Uh, the leading witch, George Burroughs, they actually come up to bring him back in chains from Wells, Maine. He'd previously been minister in Salem Village, that's how they knew him, but most of his other time he was a minister in, 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 in uh, Falmouth, which is now Portland, Maine, um, or in, in Wells. Um, and it's these connections to the frontier that get him in trouble. Or how about Mercy Short, who's a girl who grows up in what's now Berwick, Maine, which was then Salmon Falls, and she um, her family is victim of the Salmon Falls Raid, a combined French and Indian raid in 1690. Most of Mercy's family, including her parents, are killed. Um, she and some other neighborhood girls are rounded up and marched by the natives and the French back to Quebec, where these little Puritan kids are forced to convert to Catholicism. Um, and two years later, she finds herself back in Massachusetts. She's lost everything, lost her family, lost her money. Um, she's a lowly house servant for a woman. A uh, wealthy woman in Boston, and when uh, one of the uh, accused witches curses her, Mercy freaks out. Today we, we would say she has a, a, uh, she has PTSD. And when and when when Cotton Mather, her minister, asks her, tries to heal her, and says, "Okay, tell me what happened." Well, I saw Satan. Okay, Satan tempted me. What did Satan look like? He was a black man. Now again, we could talk for a week about race, but that's a good European description of the devil in the 17th century. But she modifies it and says, "Well." He wasn't black, he was tawny, like an Indian. And you read her description 
of Satan and the temptation, and she's reliving the destruction of her home and the deaths of her family. Um, and clearly, it's, it's just deeply, as anybody would be still troubled by this. So she's really sort of seeing that whole event on the frontier through the, uh, the lens of the devil and witchcraft. Um, so anyhow, these are the kinds of, these, this is sort of the, the background of what's going on. And increasingly, though, people begin to call the, the judge's work into question. Um, in, in, in part here, it's because uh, of spectral evidence, which I mentioned at the beginning is this idea of a spirit. That, uh, you know, oh, 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 Randy, stop, oh, stop pinching and hurting me. Oh, you're choking me. Stop it, stop it. Make Randy Specter stop. You're like, what do you mean? I don't see Randy Specter. Randy's sitting in the back room. He's not touching it yet. Wow. That's the way spectral evidence works. It seems kind of dubious, doesn't it? Now, I know what you're thinking. You think it's dubious because specters aren't real. But unfortunately, in 1692, people believed they were real. People believed witches were real, right? Um, and that uh, most learned people in, uh, in England and America, college presidents, learned ministers, knew witches were real. As a matter of fact, there was an effort by the leading scientists in England, led by Robert Boyle, Boyle's Law, great physicist, right? To try to prove the existence of witches and their powers. Why would that be? Well, because it is the be just the very beginning of the Age of Reason. And people are worried about belief in God. Here's the thing. If, witches, if you don't think witches are real, then perhaps the next suggests that you might not believe Satan is real, right? Well, who creates Satan? God. God creates Satan and gives him powers as a test of mankind. So if you're saying Satan isn't real, um, what do you think about God? So, you know, if we can prove that witches are real, we can prove that Satan and God are also real. Defend that. So, um, people actually question spectral evidence for another reason, and that is, is that because, oh, that's foolish, Dad. It can't be. It can't be Randy who's who's tormenting you with a specter, because Randy is a good a good person. He has a good Christian soul. He's devout, and therefore he could not harm you. Wow. So that's that depends. That's that's a big argument. Because some people would say yes, he. Yes, uh, that's true. And that means if Randy's, if it is Randy Specter, you know what that means? Is that he's in league with Satan. Other people would say, no, not at all. Uh, you know, someone else could be using Randy Specter against his will and against his knowledge. And then we know that the 